Hello, this is Professor Roman. Let's continue the lecture series on linear algebra. We've come now to chapter 9 on canonical forms. In this chapter, as in the previous one, the base field F will be either the real field or the complex field, and all vector spaces will be assumed to be finite dimensional. Our goal in this chapter is to examine the problem of finding a set of canonical forms for matrix similarity. <clears throat> Here is the definition. Just to remind you, a subset S of the vector space of all matrices of size n by n over F is a set of canonical forms for matrix similarity if there's exactly one member of S in each similarity class. <clears throat> As we discussed before, finding a, a literal set of canonical forms for similarity is not going to be possible. If you recall in chapter 2 we discussed the problem that if we have two block diagonal matrices that have the same multi-set of diagonal blocks but perhaps appearing in a different order then the matrices are similar. So if you just think in terms of diagonal matrices and these blocks would just be one by one, there is not always a, a natural way to order the elements on the diagonal. So we really can't distinguish in a meaningful way between two diagonal matrices that have the same multi-set of diagonal elements. Remember, they may be complex numbers which don't have very convenient uh, order on them. So it's simpler just to not worry about the order of the diagonal blocks and produce canonical forms up to that order. In other words, there's not going to be a unique member of the set of canonical forms in each similarity class, but it will be unique up to the order of the diagonal blocks. And that's not really a problem. Another matter I want to mention is one of notation. <clears throat> if S is a submodule of an operator module V tau, so it's an invariant tau invariant subspace of V, then the minimal polynomial of the restriction uh, we will refer to as the minimal polynomial of this operator module S sub tau, which is in fact what it is, and use either of these two notations. We'll be restricting uh, operators to submodules, so I wanted to just in mention this notation. <clears throat> it's easier to say the minimal polynomial of S sub tau than to say the minimal polynomial of the restriction of tau to the tau invariant subspace S. So it's just a, a matter of clarity. Well, Shure's theorem, which is extremely powerful, and as I mentioned before, some experts say the most important theorem in all of matrix theory, <coughs> um, is not powerful enough to provide a set of canonical forms. Schur's theorem tells us that all linear operators can be represented via an orthonormal basis by either an upper triangular matrix or an upper quasi-triangular matrix, depending on the behavior of the minimal polynomial, whether it splits or not. But there are just too many of these types of matrices 
so they're not going to form, be uh, form sets of canonical forms. We're going to have to look more closely if we expect to find a set of canonical forms. The spectral theorem will provide a set of canonical forms, but only for normal matrices, and I'll let you ponder that. Uh, in other words, the set consisting of all diagonal and upper quasi-diagonal matrices of a fixed size does form a set of canonical forms for similarity, up, again up to the order of the diagonal blocks. But normal matrices are very special matrices, so we're a long way from our goal of finding a set of canonical forms for all matrices of a given square size. To make any real headway into the problem of canonical forms for matrix similarity, we're going to need to refine one of our primary tools namely the primary decomposition of an operator module. It's a great first step. It's a, it provides a reduction of the operator, but it's not reduced far enough. <clears throat> what we know is that if the minimal polynomial splits into well, it does split, of course. The minimal polynomial splits into a product of prime powers like this. There are going to be some linear factors. There are going to be some quadratic factors raised to various powers. Then V sub tau is a direct sum of these submodules, the kernels of the individual prime powers. These are primary submodules. By definition, their um, minimal polynomials are powers of a prime. The difficulty with the primary decomposition is that it's just too coarse. The primary sum ends, while they are submodules, they're tau invariant subspaces, are just too complex. And so we've got to require further decomposition into a direct sum of simpler tau invariant subspaces. And those subspaces are the following submodules. Tau invariant subspaces are submodules. This, as we have seen, is the submodule generated by a single vector v. These are the simplest type of tau invariant subspaces. You take V and you take all um, <clears throat> powers of tau applied to V, or, or all powers of X times V. This is the submodule generated by uh, little v, and it's, it's a tau invariant subspace. Same thing as submodule. What we want to do, what we will do, is find a decomposition of V sub tau into primary cyclic submodules. So they're both primary, their minimal polynomials are power, uh, powers of a prime polynomial, and they're cyclic. So they're generated by a single vector as a submodule. That's, a, that's our goal. And it's going to be a bit tricky, um, as we'll see. Here is the official definition of the cyclic submodule or tau cyclic subspace generated by V. It's all polynomial multiples of V, P of X V, or if you like, P of tau applied to V as p ranges over all possible polynomials. And uh, as far as notation is concerned, I'm going to have to use a subscript 
here sometimes because we may have two operator we may have two modules uh, sorry two operators going on at the same time tau and sigma so we'll need that for clarity but if the operator is clear I can drop the subscript and so and sometimes I will Since a tau cyclic hub space is an operator module, it has a minimal polynomial. It's the minimal polynomial of the restriction of tau to this submodule. And so, uh, with reference to my earlier remark about notation, we have these two different notations that we'll use uh, just depending on which one seems clearer at the time. Cyclic submodules have a relatively nice basis. It's a nice basis, but we'll see later that it's not always the nicest possible basis. It's called a cyclic basis, and this is what it looks like. Tau is linear operator, little v is a vector, then the tau cyclic subspace uh, well I, I this is something I've said several times I may have I may have just removed this the tau cyclic subspace tau uh, generated by V is tau invariant and if the minimal polynomial of tau restricted to V looks like this then this is a basis, v, x, v, all the way up to x to the k minus 1 v, or this is what it looks like with x is replaced by tau. This is an ordered basis for v, and it's called the tau cyclic basis for v, for the, uh, su the submodule generated by v. And its dimension, then, is k, where k is the degree of the minimal polynomial. The matrix representation of the restriction of tau to this cyclic submodule under the tau cyclic basis looks like this. Each if you look at this basis again, it, when you apply tau to each basis vector, it just pushes it to the next vector until you apply tau to the last basis vector. And you'll get, well, tau to the kv or x to the kv. And so what you have to do is, if you apply this to v, you get 0. The last term is x to the kv, so you move all this other stuff to the other side of the equal sign. All these become negative. And so that's exactly what happened at the last column here. Each of these columns shows you that when you apply tau or multiply by x, you move to the next basis vector. The first basis vector goes to the second basis vector the second goes to the third and so on. When you hit the last one, you go to, these are the coefficients when you move the rest of the minimal polynomial to the other side of the equal sign. Okay. So this is the matrix representation of <clears throat> tau restricted to the cyclic submodule with respect to the cyclic basis. <clears throat> it's called the companion matrix for this polynomial, the minimal polynomial. The polynomial determines the matrix and vice versa because you're just staring at the coefficients basically. <clears throat> this is how should one say, nice, but not as nice as we would generally like. It's great up till the last column, and then things kind of fall apart. 
it sort of shoves all the complexity to the last column, so it doesn't really eliminate it as much as we'd like. Nonetheless, these are very important matrix representations, as we will see. This is the proof. Uh, the vectors in the cyclic uh, basis are linearly independent because if we have a linear combination of them equal to zero, <clears throat> then this polynomial annihilates V and therefore all of the cyclic submodule. But it has degree K minus one which is one less than the degree of the minimal polynomial. And so the only way out is that this polynomial is the zero polynomial. In other words, all the coefficients are zero. <clears throat> and we just discussed how the matrix representation comes about. Uh, as far as spanning uh, the submodule, um, every vector W in the submodule is a multiple polynomial multiple of V, and by a familiar, hopefully by now familiar division argument, you would divide this by, I shouldn't give it away, I'll, I'll let you work out the rest of this. It's just one or two lines. This theorem has a useful corollary. If tau is a linear operator and this is a, the tau cyclic subspace generated by V, every eigenvalue lambda of the restricted operator has geometric multiplicity one. Its, uh, its eigenspace is just one-dimensional. For proof, here again is the minimal polynomial, and here is the matrix representation. So if we are seeking eigenvectors, we need to look at this matrix, find its kernel, well, this matrix has rank at least k minus 1, there's k columns, because the first, because all but the last column, if you look at just these columns, they are li clearly linearly independent. So the column rank is at least k minus 1, it could be k. <clears throat> Therefore, the um, by the rank nullity theorem, the uh, the nullity, the dimension of the kernel, is at most one. Well, it has to be one, at least one, if lambda is really an eigenvalue, because then it's got to have an eigenvector. So there's got to be a non-zero vector in this kernel. So in fact, the rank of this matrix is k minus one, and its kernel. Has, rank, has dimension one, so that and that's the uh, dimension of the eigenspace for lambda. <clears throat> the theorem we just proved shows that if we can decompose an operator module into a direct sum of cyclic subspaces, which is what we are trying to do. <clears throat> Then we can piece together the tau cyclic bases for each of the cyclic summands and get a big ordered basis <clears throat> under which tau has a diagonal matrix representation where each of these blocks is a companion matrix. <clears throat> it's the matrix representation uh, for the restriction of tau to a cyclic subspace, a uh, uh, cyclic submodule. <clears throat> and so these are companion matrices. This is the famous rational canonical form. 
for tau. So that's where we are headed. And we have considerable ground to cover because <clears throat> the if here, if we can decompose v tau into a direct sum of tau cyclic subspaces, that is the tricky if. We can do it, and we will do it, but it'll take a bit of preparation. <clears throat> uh, here's the terminology that goes along with this. Any decomposition of tau sub v into a direct sum of primary cyclic tau cyclic subspaces or primary cyclic submodules looks like this is called a primary cyclic decomposition of tau v so that's what we're after finding a primary cyclic decomposition of an operator module That'll give us this canonical, the rational canonical form. The minimal polynomials of these submodules, or in other words, of the res of the restriction of tau to these uh, subspaces, <clears throat> that forms a multi-set. There's no there's no reason why these minimal polynomials have to be distinct. So in general, this will be a multi-set. And it is called the, the multi-set. These uh, polynomials are called the elementary divisors of this decomposition, or of the module. Uh, I'm sorry, or of the operator. Okay. <clears throat> I called here the elementary divisors of the decomposition because we there may be more than one primary cyclic decomposition, and it. Could, at this moment, we don't know whether that would change the minimal polynomials. In fact, we'll see that it does not. So we can refer to these elementary divisors as the elementary divisors of the operator. And this is the critical point, because the elementary divisors form a complete invariant for similarity. <clears throat> and the rational canonical form, as the name suggests, forms a set of canonical forms for similarity, again, up to the order of the diagonal elements. Before getting to the primary cyclic decomposition, we need to take a look at isomorphisms of operator modules. Of course, we've been familiar for some time with linear transformations, vector space isomorphisms. But we haven't discussed structure-preserving maps between operator modules. And as you might expect, the pattern is very similar. Oh, it, we just have to preserve all of the structure of the operator module. So, say we have two operator modules. <coughs> A linear operator on V the underlying vector space for both modules is called an operator module map or simply a module map <clears throat> and I'll just use this notation if uh, phi preserves polynomial scalar multiplication we already know it preserves addition because it's a linear operator it preserves scalar multiplication of the vector space V. Now it preserves also polynomial scalar multiplication. <clears throat> Another way to write that is like this. <clears throat> uh, I, this notation is perhaps a little more elegant, sometimes more useful. But you have to keep in mind that even though the polynomial P of X is the same on both sides, it acts differently. On the left side, P of X is application of P of sigma, whereas on the right side, multiplication by P of X is application of P of tau. <clears throat> A bijective operator module is called an operator module isomorphism, or simply a module isomorphism. 
and we'll use the familiar notation for isomorphism. Now it's not hard to see that a linear operator phi <coughs> is a module map if and only if it behaves properly with respect to multiplication by x. <coughs> or put another way, phi of sigma v equals tau of phi of v. Uh, behaving properly with respect to x means it will also do so with respect to powers of x, and then the linearity will tell us that it will do so with respect to all polynomials. So it'll be an, a module map. <coughs> Another way to write this module map condition when phi is bijective looks like this. And this might be familiar to you from lectures quite a while ago. This says that tau and sigma are similar operators. So here is a theorem. <coughs> a vector space automorphism phi is an operator module isomorphism between these two operator modules if and only if the modules, uh, the, sorry, the operators have this relationship, so they are similar. An operator module isomorphism sends submodules to submodules, and in particular cyclic submodules to cyclic submodules. This shouldn't be a surprise. Being an isomorphism, all the module structure is preserved, so submodules go to submodules. That's a common theme. <clears throat> Group isomorphisms send subgroups to subgroups. Ring isomorphisms send subrings to subrings. Lattice isomorphisms send sublattices to sublattices, and so on. <clears throat> Isomorphic operator modules have the same annihilator and therefore also the same minimal polynomial. Two cyclic submodules are isomorphic if and only if they have the same minimal polynomial. This is going to be useful to us quite a bit. An operator module isomorphism preserves reductions. So if we have a reduction of sigma and we apply an operator module isomorphism, we get a reduction of tau. We've already proven part one. As to part two, <coughs> um, <clears throat> an operator module isomorphism sends submodules to submodules, cyclic submodules to cyclic submodules. <coughs> a submodule is uh, this is a tau in, or in this case, a sigma invariant subspace. So let's suppose we have such a subspace. Multiplication of phi of s, we want to show that's also um, invariant. Multiplication of that by x, we can swap, we can put the x on the inside because phi is a module map, but xs is s, or contained in s anyway, because um, S is a submodule, and so that's we have this containment in phi of S. So uh, phi of S is uh, closed under multiplication by X, and therefore it's a submodule. <coughs> For cyclic submodules, it's just a matter of writing out the definition. Phi of a cyclic submodule looks like this. It's phi applied to all polynomial multiples of the generator, and the phi goes inside, again, because phi is a module map, so we have all polynomial multiples of this vector, phi u, and that's the cyclic submodule generated by phi u <coughs> with respect to tau. Part three, that operator module, isomorphic operator modules have the same annihilator, <clears throat> goes like this. 
if a polynomial annihilates phi sigma, that's true <clears throat> applying phi, so that's true if and only if this is true. And again, P of x comes out, but phi of v sigma is v tau. So v sigma and v tau have the same, annihilate, uh, same annihilators. <coughs> and therefore, <coughs> the same minimal polynomial. For part four, two cyclic submodules are isomorphic if and only if they have the same minimal polynomial. <coughs> well, we've just seen that if they're isomorphic, they have the same annihilators and therefore the same minimal polynomial. For the converse, suppose that um, the two uh, modules have the same minimal polynomial. <coughs> so that means that sigma restricted to <coughs> this submodule, this minimal polynomial, we'll call it m of x, is the same as the minimal polynomial of tau restricted to to um, this submodule. Well, they, each of these submodules has a cyclic basis, sigma cyclic and tau cyclic. Okay, so this multiplication by x is application of sigma, this one is application of tau, because <clears throat> we're in two different modules. And the degree, uh, and the, the stump index k here, this exponent, is the degree of the minimal polynomial, because we have k of these vectors. Well, <clears throat> we want to show these two submodules are isomorphic, so we can define a map between the two by sending this basis to this basis. That automatically gives us a linear isomorphism. But <clears throat> for any polynomial, we have phi p of x u equals p of x v. I'll let you check that, but it's pretty straightforward. And so this is, in fact, phi is, in fact, a module isomorphism, and they're, so the submodules are isomorphic. The final <clears throat> property about preserving reductions goes like this. <clears throat> Since phi is a vector space isomorphism, when we apply phi to this direct sum, we get another direct sum, decomposition. <clears throat> but since phi is an operator module isomor uh, isomorphism, it sends submodules to submodules. So these are tau invariant, or, uh, tau invariant subspaces, <clears throat> and therefore this is a reduction of tau. Okay, that's the main result on isomorphisms of operator modules. Now, it has some important special cases. <clears throat> the coordinate map is an important operator module isomorphism. So let's suppose V tau is an n-dimensional operator module with ordered basis B. And so the coordinate map <clears throat> looks like this. We should be familiar with this by now. <clears throat> We've also known for quite some time, I think since chapter 2, <clears throat> that this formula holds. This is how we use the matrix representation of tau. <clears throat> this can be written in terms of the coordinate map like this. Now, V tau is an operator module, but so is Fn under this matrix representation, <clears throat> multiplication by this matrix. And this can be written then this way. Multiplication by x is application of tau when we're in this module v sub tau. Multiplication by x in this module this operator module is multiplication by this matrix. But that tells us <clears throat> that phi sub b is an operator module map 
but it's bijective, so it's an operator module isomorphism. <coughs> so we can then <coughs> apply the results of the previous theorem, giving us a corollary, and I'll, I'll let you read this yourself. It's, it's, it's just a translation, a literal translation of the previous theorem in terms of this coordinate map. <clears throat> the previous theorem also gives us this result. If A and B are, <clears throat> this was part one of the previous theorem, if A and B are matrices, then these two operator modules are isomorphic if and only if the matrices are similar because, let me go back here to the first statement, <laughs> this becomes this. <clears throat> A vector space automorphism of Fn is just multiplication by an invertible matrix, square invertible matrix. <clears throat> Okay, so we are now at the point where we can attack the primary cyclic decomposition of a linear operator, which we'll do in the next lecture.